Hello and welcome back to the channel. Thank you ever so much to the sponsors. I truly appreciate your generosity. Thank you for watching. And um, let's talk a little bit about something that I mentioned in a previous video, namely strengthening and dealing with hogging stresses on very long vessels. This has been a challenge for naval construction ever since the emergence of the gun-armed uh, warship, dedicated warship. Artillery is very heavy. Um, it is fairly high above the center of gravity of the vessel. So it presents two major challenges right there. Weight, way too high. So there is the stability challenge, but there is also the strength challenge. How do you resist? Peter Goodwin many years ago told me that the stress that the whole structure undergoes when you fire your own 18-pounder, one single 18-pounder, the stress is equivalent to the stress of an 18-wheeler truck running into the side of the ship at 55 miles an hour. For uh, Europeans, that is about 88 kilometers an hour. Imagine what is the stress when you have an entire battery of 18-pounders. Even if they are not going off uh, simultaneously, they prefer the rolling fire, this still is an enormous stress on the vessel. Then, of course, especially with the 44-gun frigates, uh, similar to the Constitution, the longer the vessel, the more hogging stress on this. When you add an extremely heavy artillery of 24-pounders, up to 60 guns, as originally the Constitution carried, despite being rated for 44, then you have a recipe for quick destruction of a vessel and hogging. We do see some evidence about these stresses in the surveyor's report on the USS President after she was captured in 1815. Although the explanation for her capture was that she ran aground off Sandy Hook and this damaged the ship. We do not see this at all described in the survey. They are analyzing uh, deterioration in the quality of the timbers, weakening of the uh, fastenings of the vessel, pretty much the things that you would expect an aging ship that has not been properly maintained and that is uh, not properly strengthened to suffer from, but nothing that can be attributed to grounding. The point, however, is that the Constitution did have initially timbers, diagonal bracing, diagonal riders inside the vessel to combat exactly this. Humphreys and his fellow American shipwrights were perfectly well aware of it. Often we believe that we invented this uh, bracing system. In reality, this dates back to the 16th century. Mary Rose had diagonal bracing system inside her hold. This is not, of course, a panacea. On the one hand side, yes, this strengthens and adds enormous strength to the vessel, but on the other hand side, you are taking up an awful lot of space in the hold, right where you're supposed to be storing provisions for a long cruise, and you're dedicating to this strengthening. So, as with everything else involved with shipbuilding, this is a compromise. You can't get everything at the same time. But the issue how to deal with this is uh, not new. Sometimes we believe that it emerged in the end of the French Nap uh, Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, that it was the development of Snodgrass, etc. But it was not, as I said. We already see it on the Mary Rose. Then throughout the 17th century, we see diagonal bracing inside the hold that is uh, touching from uh, one end of uh, the beam on the gun deck, diagonally across the hold all the way to the turn of the bilge and the foot whaling on the opposite side of the vessel. They could also be crossed and fastened to each other at the crossing point, these timbers. They seem to disappear towards the end of the 17th century. Interestingly, some of the contemporary models actually show them in place. The E3 model, or otherwise known as Sheldon's model in the Swedish Maritime Museum, has remnants of these bracings visible inside the hold. 
if you can actually uh, look uh, with the camera inside. So here in uh, Steele's book, he is providing some uh, illustrations of these bracing systems. On the left hand side is the image of the traditional construction of the vessel with transversal riders, sets of riders that are essentially duplicating the floor timber, fatek, top timber system, but they are replicating on the inside of the ceiling. They could be anywhere from about lower five all the way to 11 such uh, sets. In the case of uh, Vasa, they are 28. But again, I repeat the shortcoming, although they undoubtedly add significant strength to the vessel, the negative of their usage is that they take up way too much space. And as navies extended their uh, fields of operation and from essentially coastal protection uh, forces became uh, globe-trotting power projections over great distances, this was no longer acceptable. Fast forward to the end of the Napoleonic Wars, where a number of things are happening at the same time. The Royal Navy is finally beginning to wear itself out. The cost of building new ships is skyrocketing, ships are increasing in size, and the resources are not there anymore to build uh, powerful vessels. This is when Snodgrass begins to develop his systems of bracing inside the vessels. And for all practical purposes, he returns to exactly what master shipwrights in the 17th century have done. And this is what I meant when I earlier in a different time and place said that what, comes around, what goes around comes around. And in essence, nothing new is ever developed. The details may change. For example, he uses a lot of strap iron to fasten uh, these cross uh, timbers. <clears throat> to strengthen. He has moved instead of crossing uh, from one side of the vessel diagonally across to the opposite side. In this case, they are bracing the beams down to the keelson, each on each side, as is visible here in these two illustrations. The one is the classical 36 gun frigate, the other one is your typical 74 gun ship of the line. But in both cases, these timbers have added enormous amount of strength that uh, revive vessels without uh, having to be rebuilt completely, only with this added bracing system can be brought back into surface <clears throat> so their useful life can be extended. With the end of the Napoleonic Wars, we have reached a stage where ships had enormously increased in size. Uh, they're carrying heavier and more guns than before. They're much longer in uh, length. For example, your typical first rate now is over 200 foot long instead of 170, 180 of the 18th century. Instead of carrying the 100 guns that Victory is carrying, 104 if we have to be uh, <clears throat> specific, your average first rate is now 120 gun with experiments to extend this even further, the highly successful Caledonia class of vessels for the Royal Navy. The French, of course, are uh, slightly ahead of the curve. They are doing exactly the same things with enlarging. From a 74, the, classic, the standard uh, ship of the line becomes an 80 gun. Uh, the new 90 gun vessel is more powerful than uh, the old 100 gun ships. All this lengthening, frigates, increase from a standard of 32, maybe 38. Suddenly they are in the vicinity of 48 to 60 gun frigates on two decks. And yet the timber resources are limited. The timbers are no longer, uh, trees do not grow to the sizes to which they are needed. So this is a period of uh, incredible innovation of how you frame such enormous monster of a ship of the line built out of natural resources. And some of the drawings that you see here are the proposals, not grass proposals, as early as the Napoleonic Wars of how to deal with these increasing strengths, how to strengthen the vessels, how to make them more useful and to extend their life so that you actually have a larger effective force 
than you otherwise would, even if you still have the same nominal force. But if your ships are in dock undergoing major repairs, they are not at sea, they are not doing their job. So this is a very technically very interesting period. These are very interesting technical solutions that emerge in this period. And I wish I could be even more enthusiastic about them. But alas, my heart belongs to the 17th century. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all the best. Very pleasant rest of your day or evening, as the case may be. Thank you so much to the sponsors. And I'll see you next time. Thank you.